tonight sending a message US UK coalition strike Iran backed Houthi targets in Yemen after a spate of ship attacks in the Red Sea the military attacks more than a dozen Houthi targets by air surface and subsurface platforms closing arguments former US president Donald Trump maintains innocence as the state says that the buck stopped with him uh, they don't have any facts they don't have any evidence against us a ruling is expected by January 31st for Trump who is accused of defrauding lenders a new reign King Frederick the 9th will ascend to the Danish throne this Sunday as Queen Margaret abdicates after ruling for 52 years and a TikTok craze salt burn moves rattles the socials as an age old song makes a comeback all there and more as world news tonight starts right now this is Ana Verna world news tonight reporting from Colombo here's Mahish Jani a very good evening everyone thank you for joining us on world news tonight as well as always we have a lot of stories to report to you from across the world let's get you the latest uh, with the events that's unfolding in Yemen right now the US and UK militaries launched strikes against multiple Houthi targets in Houthi rebel controlled areas of Yemen earlier the US and its allies warned that the Iran backed military militant group would bear the consequences of repeated drone and missile attacks on commercial shipping in the Red Sea US President Joe Biden said he ordered the strikes in direct response to unprecedented Houthi rebel attacks against international maritime vessels in the Red Sea American and British aircraft carried out strikes on Houthi targets in Yemen on Thursday, a dramatic expansion of the war in the Middle East. This came after weeks of Houthi attacks on maritime shipping in the Red Sea and days after US and British naval forces shot down 21 Houthi drones and missiles, some of which President Joe Biden said directly targeted American ships. Clips from U.S. Central Command showed American fighter jets taking off from an aircraft carrier at sea. Meanwhile, the U.K.'s Defense Ministry released video of what it said were jets launched from RAF Akritori on Cyprus. British defense officials say their attacks have hit the Houthis' ability to target ships, while a U.S. official said over a dozen sites were hit with precision munitions. While Washington says it has no intent to escalate tensions, the Houthis have vowed to retaliate. A Houthi spokesperson said after the strikes that they will continue targeting ships headed towards Israel. The Iran-backed group has attacked 27 ships in the Red Sea since December. They say it's a show of support for the Palestinians and Hamas. The attacks have disrupted maritime shipping. Some firms now avoid Red Sea routes, stoking up energy and food prices. A U.S.-led task force called Operation Prosperity Garden has been set up to defend shipping lines, and over 20 countries signed up to join it. Thursday strikes took place outside that coalition. President Biden cautioned in a statement late on Thursday he would not hesitate to take further action if needed. Well, China has warned voters in Taiwan to make the right choice a day before presidential election on their self-rule island, which Beijing claims. China has earlier said that a win for the ruling party candidate William Lai would pose a danger to relations. It also criticized brazen chattering by the U.S. after Washington warned Beijing not to stoke tensions ahead of tomorrow's vote. Taiwanese voters are caught between local policies and Chinese demands ahead of the island's presidential and parliamentary elections tomorrow. The ruling Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, is aiming for an unprecedented third term in office. But no matter who wins the elections, security officials say Beijing's military and economic pressure on Taiwan could continue or even increase. Beijing has framed the vote as a choice between war and peace and could hold new military drills around the island no matter who wins. 
The U.S. will also be watching the election closely as the island has long been a thorny issue in its relations with Beijing. Both major parties in Taiwan say the island is a sovereign country but offer different views on relations with China. Vice President Lai ching te the DPP's presidential candidate, has urged people not to be swayed by threats. But he has offered talks with Beijing and pledged not to upset the status quo. The opposition Kuomintang calls the DPP separatists and staunchly opposes independence. The national detour from violent riots in Papua New Guinea has climbed to 22 with the remains of six people found in Port Moresby today. It's understood that the remains of six people were found at two different uh, shops in the city that were looted and set on fire. A 14-day state of emergency is in effect in Port Moresby as authorities try to restore law and order as well as essential services following the violent riots. Following uh, the latest events uh, from Australia is Adha Dirana's special correspondent Sanishka Jayasena who joins me now from Ballarat in Australia. Sanishka. Yes, Mahesh. Soldiers and police patrol Port Moresby a day after Papua New Guinea declared a state of emergency in response to rioting and other violence in which at least 16 people are reported to have died. The Prime Minister, James Marape, declared a 14-day state of emergency, suspending several officials and putting more than 1,000 soldiers on standby. After a police and public sector protest overpay on Wednesday descended into rioting and looting. The city had returned to a new normal on Friday morning with police and soldiers on the streets and long lines at petrol stations. According to Matt Cannon, who heads the local branch of a non-profit emergency responder service at St. John Ambulance. Marape faced a number of calls to resign, including from the former Prime Minister Peter O'Neill. Australia's Defence Minister Richard Marles said the situation in the country had improved and that the Papua New Guinea government had issued some small requests for assistance from Canberra. Mahish? Absolutely. Sanishka Jaya there a special correspondent reporting from Ballarat in Australia. Thank you very much. Now, former U.S. President Donald Trump took charge of his own defense in a civil fraud trial that threatened to level his business empire, telling a New York judge that he had been victimized by a politically motivated case and that he should be paid damages for his suffering. His surprise uh, five-minute intervention came just before the lunch break on the final day of a civil fraud trial that began in early October of last year. Fireworks in the courtroom. Donald Trump delivering his own closing argument in his Manhattan civil fraud trial today. Facing the prospect of losing control of his namesake company and a massive civil penalty, Mr. Trump briefly took matters into his own hands, declaring himself an innocent man, delivering a nearly five-minute speech, largely grievances against the New York Attorney General and the judge overseeing the case, whom he accused of having his own agenda. All that forcing Judge Arthur N. Gorin, who previously resisted granting the former president permission to speak in closings, to call on Mr. Trump's attorneys to, quote, control their client. They don't have any evidence against us. Millions and millions of pages, years of litigation and all politically motivated. The surreal scene in court today playing out just hours after police responded to a bomb threat at Judge N. Gorin's home. The judge having become a target months ago after deciding the heart of the state's case against Mr. Trump, his sons and the Trump organization, finding them liable for fraud. The attorney general's office now asking for a $370 million civil penalty against Trump for ill-gotten gains, alleging his company intentionally exaggerated the value of some of its most well-known real estate properties like Mar-a-Lago and 40 Wall Street to receive better loans from banks. We have produced evidence about the scope, the scale, the depth, the breadth of the illegality the fraud that impersonally enriched Donald Trump. Mr. Trump said in court today the banks got all their money back as his defense team implored the judge not to impose the corporate death penalty for what they call a victimless crime. Arguments Judge and Gorin previously rejected in his September summary judgment decision. A U.S. aviation regulator said that they were investigating Boeing following the mid-air blowout of a fuselage panel 
on a 737 MAX 9 aircraft. Now, the U.S. Uh, Federal Aviation Administration said that it would examine whether the products the company built matched the design specification approved by regulators and whether the jets were in a safe condition to operate. Uh, following that story for us tonight is other Deraner's Anuradhi Vikram Singh, who joins me right here in the studio. Anuradhi, uh, good to see you once again. Now, what's the latest on this story? Because we've heard that investigations are currently underway. Yes, Mahesh, it seems that Boeing's entire operation could actually be in for calamity as a former NTSB member has also said that the very process is being caught into question. Here's a look at the latest. Turbulence kept up for Boeing on Thursday as U.S. authorities announced an official investigation into the plane maker's 737 MAX 9 jet. That's after a cabin panel tore off an Alaska Airlines flight last week and forced an emergency landing. The Federal Aviation Administration informed Boeing of the probe in a letter on Wednesday, citing, quote, additional discrepancies in other MAX 9 planes. Boeing replied that they would, quote, cooperate fully. Boeing CEO told CNBC on Wednesday that a, quote, quality escape issue led to the MAX 9 in question being approved to fly. The plane maker's shares have dropped more than 10 percent since the incident. The FAA has grounded 171 Boeing planes with the same panel pending safety inspections and have not said when that order might be lifted. Most of the grounded planes are operated by United and Alaska Airlines. Both airlines reported Monday they had found loose parts on multiple grounded aircraft and have each canceled hundreds of flights this week. It's the latest in a series of events that have shaken confidence in Boeing. In 2019, aviation authorities grounded all MAX planes for over a year and a half after hundreds died in two crashes, one in Ethiopia and another in Indonesia, which were linked to poorly designed cockpit software. The crisis eroded Boeing's 50% share of the passenger jet market, and the company ended 2023 behind rival Airbus for the fifth year running. On Thursday, Airbus posted a record number of annual net new jet orders that tallied nearly 800 more than Boeing. Airbus's CEO told reporters it was closely monitoring the investigation of its rival. Meanwhile, Ryanair passengers and Ryanair itself is not concerned with the grounding of the 737s and will continue to use them in flight. Mahish? Well, if you're flying um, Ryanair, it seems like it's a bit dodgy. But the thing is, uh, no accidents actually occurred right now. No people, I mean, there was no people who act, had to pay with their lives in this incident. Let's hope and see that it remains that way. Anuradhi Vikramasinghe, thank you very much. All right, let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stick around. Welcome back everyone to World News. Now on the first day of spot Bitcoin exchange traded fund uh, trading, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which is a converted version of an already existing financial product, dominated the competition. That said, there is reason to believe that this could be a temporary phenomenon. There was more than $4.6 billion worth of trading volume in spot Bitcoin ETFs on US exchange uh, yesterday, which was the first day the newly approved financial product were allowed to be traded. Bitcoin has closed out its first day on Wall Street. Exchange traded funds or ETFs in the top cryptocurrency were trading for the first time on Thursday and it proved to be a busy day. Around $4.6 billion in shares in such funds changed hands. That's according to data from LSEG. It all came after the ETFs were approved by US regulators. The Securities and Exchange Commission had given the green light a day earlier. That followed a decade-long legal tussle with backers of the crypto funds. SEC boss Gary Gensler still isn't a fan, calling Bitcoin a speculative, volatile asset. He said approval for the ETFs was in no way an endorsement of virtual money. Nonetheless, it's a watershed moment for the crypto sector. Supporters say the funds will make it much easier for people to invest in Bitcoin. They won't have to hold the coins themselves, but can just buy and sell shares in the funds. Bitcoin itself rose around 0.7% on Thursday, buoyed by the enthusiasm. Products from BlackRock, Fidelity and Grayscale dominated the first day of trade. 
But other big players remain wary. Vanguard, the top provider of mutual funds, said it had no plans to make Bitcoin ETFs available to brokerage clients on its platform. Well, Denmark is to get a new king this Sunday after its reigning queen, Margaret II, who uh, reigned the Scandinavian nation for over half a century, stepped down recently. Her abdication on Sunday will be the first time a Danish monarch has stepped down voluntarily in nearly 900 years. Queen Margaret II, Denmark's monarch for more than half a century, stunned her country when she announced on New Year's Eve that she will hand over the throne to her eldest son, Crown Prince Frederick. Her abdication on Sunday will be the first time a Danish monarch has stepped down voluntarily in nearly 900 years. The 83-year-old queen is poised to pass the throne to her eldest son, Prince Frederick, and his wife, Princess Mary, originally a Sydney marketing executive, in a transition set for Sunday. Princess Mary is set to become the first Australian-born queen, a transformation that has held the fascination of Australians for years. In Denmark, formal power resides with the elected parliament and its government. The monarch is expected to stay above partisan politics, representing the nation with traditional duties ranging from state visits to National Day celebrations. Well, let's get you the latest on the road to the White House. The former South Carolina governor, Nikki Haley, emerged from the last televised debate before the Iowa caucus, clearly Donald Trump's strongest challenger for the Republican presidential nomination, boosted by the withdrawal of Chris Christie. Voting begins uh, in Iowa on Monday before New Hampshire stages its primary uh, a week on Tuesday. Haley has closed on Trump in New Hampshire and has hopes of seizing second place in Iowa at the expense of the right-wing Florida governor, Ron DeSantis. Nikki Haley tonight shrugging off this hot mic Chris Christie critique, threatening to blunt her momentum in the final four days before the Iowa caucuses. And she's going to get smoked. And you and I both know it. She's not up to this. So get excited. Four days until caucus. Haley has ridden rising poll numbers into a battle for second place in Iowa behind Donald Trump, hoping to defy expectations here. All the media pundits love to talk about how they know what's going to happen in Iowa. I trust that you did your homework. I trust that you know where you want the country to go. Her crowds now growing. But Haley's recent rise has put a political target on her back. The Trump campaign launching a new ad highlighting her views on Social Security this morning. Haley's plan cut Social Security benefits. And Ron DeSantis, who has focused his campaign heavily on Iowa and needs a strong showing here, mocking her debate performance. I think it was like a Hillary Clinton type performance. Haley expecting to outlast the Florida governor. Our goal is not to worry about petty things that others say. It's more about what do we need to do to get that next vote. Well, let's get the latest. Uh, watching the U.S. election for us tonight is our leader, Susan Shanali, who joins me now from Toronto, Canada. Shanali, do you think Haley has a chance to pull up and uh, pull off an upset over Donald Trump? Definitely, Mahesh. It is clear that a lot of people, and especially Democrats, are hoping for a big upset of that nature mainly because they believe that U.S. President Joe Biden will not stand a chance against former President Trump, but it would not be wise to rule him out well just yet. Severe weather has impacted Iowa this week and Iowans will be racing for another round. Residents were preparing to hunker down with a temperature drop and snow expected overnight. Despite the cold, some are still optimistic about a positive turnout for the caucus on Monday, while uh, former President Donald Trump holds a substantial polling lead, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former U.S. U.N. Ambassador and South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley are fighting hard for second place in the hope that it will give them the boost they need ahead of the New Hampshire primary. Mahish? Absolutely. Well, what we got to do is to wait and see. Let's just do that. Well, Suzanne Shanali, other than a special correspondent reporting from Toronto in Canada. Thank you very much. Well, with just uh, less than 200 days to go, Paris 2024 is on track to deliver the Olympic and Paralympic Games of a new era. 
This was the message developed by the International Olympic Committee Coordination Commission following a three-day visit to the French capital where the commission met with organizers and local authorities to discuss a readiness preparation. Following that story for us tonight is Adhadarana's Chetana Dharmaratna, who is now in Paris, France, and joins me via Zoom with the latest. Chetana? Yes, Mahish. The Paris 2024 Olympic Games are set to begin on 26th July. With less than 200 days to go before the Games begin, organizers are working flat out to complete venues that are behind schedule. The president of the organizing committee, Tony Estangue, says the huge amount of work that has been done so far is useless if it is not finished. According to Nicola Ferra, CEO of Solidio, 84% of the work has been completed compared with the 89% plan. However, the company in charge of delivering the venues and infrastructure of the Paris 2024 Olympic Games has identified a number of problems. One of them is security. On the 70 sites that have been opened, 168 accidents have been recorded, four times the fever than usual. There have been delays in three areas, work on the Grand Palais, three buildings in the Olympic Village, and the Columbus Swimming Pool, the training center for synchronized swimming. But these are only few weeks old and do not appear to have affected the competition. Mahish? Indeed, uh, Chetana Dharmaratna, the Dharana Special Correspondent, reporting from Paris, France. Thank you. Well, Netflix has removed an Indian language film from its uh, platform after the movie faced a backlash on social media for depicting the daughter of a Hindu priest eating meat. Hindus are India's largest religion uh, grouping, and Hindu priests, as well as their families, are typically vegetarian. An Indian film that received backlash for hurting Hindu religion sentiments has been removed from Netflix days after it began streaming. Netflix said the Tamil language film Annapurani, the goddess of food, was removed at its licensor's request. The movie stars actor Nayanathara as a Hindu Brahmin woman who aspires to become a chef. She is shown going against her family's religious beliefs and eating meat and learning to cook it. Many Brahmins do not eat meat in accordance with rigid caste rules. Members of hardline Hindu organizations had objected to this and other scenes in the movie, including one where the actress is shown offering namaz or Muslim prayers before cooking biryani. Some Hindus also took offense at a scene where a Muslim character says that Hindu god Ram ate meat. The film's producers have not officially commented on the issue as of yet. A police case has also been filed in Madhya Pradesh state against Nayanathara and two others associated with the film. Let's take a short commercial break. More the news right after this. Welcome back everyone to World News Tonight. Now, Tesla is halting most output at its uh, big factory in Germany. The uh, electronic vehicle maker says it's running short of parts due to the uh, chaos in global shipping sparked by attacks in the Red Sea. Yemen's Houthi militants have been targeting vessels there for weeks, as we just reported earlier in the bulletin. Major shipping firms have had to put vessels on safer but much longer routes as a result, delaying deliveries. Container giant Maersk says it expects the rerouting to persist for the foreseeable future. Now Tesla is the first major firm to disclose an interruption to output. It says production in Berlin will stop from January 29th to February 11th. Analysts say Tesla relies heavily on batteries from China, which are shipped through the Red Sea. They say other automakers seem sure to face disruption, given the dependence on parts from Asia. For Tesla, it all adds to difficulties as it fights a labor dispute with a Swedish union. That has led to sympathy strikes across the Nordic region, including at a Norwegian parts supplier. On Thursday, the firm didn't give any detail on how many components were missing or how it would restore production. Well, NASA's efforts to return astronauts to the moon have been delayed again. 
The agency announced that its next attempt mission, which was to have sent four astronauts on a flight around the moon in, uh, in a next generation capsule, will launch in September of 2025 rather than later this year. A subsequent mission to actually land astronauts near the moon's south pole will be delayed till September 2026. Well, although a Murder on the Dance Floor came out in 2001, it's back on the Billboard charts after being featured in Saltburn. Now, social media is flooded with people sashaying around their homes just like the provocative movie. A new dance craze is sweeping America. And the song everyone is jamming to is more than two decades old. It's Murder on the Dance Floor. Murder on the Dance Floor first came out in 2001, but it's back on the Billboard charts today after being featured in the provocative movie Saltburn. The psychological thriller follows two preppy students from Oxford University during their summer break at a palatial estate called Saltburn. In the final scene, the film star Barry Keoghan gleefully dances throughout the extravagant home, and he's completely naked. Now, social media is flooded with people sashaying around their homes, just like that last scene in the Amazon Prime movie. Mom of two, Vithya Gopalan, can't get enough of the dance craze. I just noticed other people doing this as a trend, and so I was like, oh, this would be kind of fun to just run around my house with this song. The singer Sophie Ellis Bextor is delighted that after all these years, her 23-year-old long-forgotten hit is getting a second life. I think it's pretty glorious and it's lots of fun. It's on the dance floor. Now that song came out in 2001 and I was in school and when it came out, first thing I was trying to figure out is who was murdered? Who is she talking about? But then in later years, I find out that it was about a competition that she basically explains in the music video. Not much sophisticated stuff back then. <laughs> well, that is uh, from all of us at World News uh, for this week. We'll be back again on Monday at the same time. And I'll see you at 7 p.m. on Get Real and, uh, on Monday. And of course, uh, on World News at 9.35. Enjoy your weekend. Good night.